I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Natasha Vita Moore, a pioneering leader and community organizer in transhumanism, a proponent of human rights, morphological freedom, and the ethical means for human enhancement. Called an early adapter of revolutionary changes by Wired Magazine and a role model for super longevity by The Village Voice, Natasha is the founder of the H Plus DAO, the first transhumanist decentralized autonomous organization. She's also the current executive director of Humanity Plus, has served as president of the Extropy Inst Institute, and is on the scientific board of Lifespan.io. She's a distinguished senior fellow at the Future of Mind Institute at FAU, where as a scientist, she achieved a breakthrough in vitrification and long-term memory. Natasha holds a PhD from the University of Plymouth. Her dissertation covers the theory and practice of life extension. She also holds a master's of philosophy and a master of science degrees. She's a retired senior professor at UAT and has lectured at Harvard, Stanford, Virginia Commonwealth, Cambridge, Alto, and Polytechnic Universities, and was a visiting scholar at 21st Century Medicine. She joins us today to discuss transhumanism, human augmentation, life extension, and cryopreservation. So Natasha, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. When it comes to transhumanism, I've always regarded you as really the contemporary spokesperson and leader of this philosophical movement. So let me start out by asking you maybe for a brief demonstrate a brief definition of transhumanism and maybe some of the key influencers in this area that you would recommend people learn more about. To define transhumanism can be daunting, but I think it's pretty simple. It's all about improving the human condition. The big qualifier there is what on earth do you mean by the human condition? And this is where people often wrestle with it, especially in the, the philosophical arts. But if you look at it as a scientist or even a psychologist or anthropologist, the human condition is the condition in which we exist, which means we are biological animals with a shelf life, a limited lifespan. We are comprised of our DNA and our chromosomal links, which we have inherited for the most part. There is something called epigenetics, which, which adds to that. We can build ourselves out as we deem we'd like to be. We try to become the person or persons we, we would honor and respect. And oftentimes that goes astray because we have something known as the brainstem or the reptilian brain, which is innate in the human being, which stems from our earliest evolution as hominids. So that flight or flight instinct is, is prevalent and it causes some emotional baggage or discharge. So the transhumanism philosophy is looking at overcoming some of these elements of the condition that hinder us or, or limit us in becoming more humane people to achieving um, a longer lifespan, to overcoming the, the tremendous deficit and, and pain and anguish of disease and loss, and to help us build out a more um, prosperous humanity for all. There's only one human species, and no matter what your gender is, your color is, your wealth is, your location is, we are all part of that species. And that fundamentally is transhumanism to overcome the human condition in the, the sense of trying to become more humane and extend life so that we're rid of the disease and the aging that that is is so troublesome to so many people, especially the, the part of disease that inhibits us. Um, the, uh, the influence of transhumanism in philosophy has been great. Uh, it's seen as um, a turn from postmodernist rhetoric. It's similar to posthumanism in many ways, but posthumanism lacks the vision that the transhumanist scholars have built out seriously. And um, posthumanism is more of a science fiction adaptation of what we will become as humans and the posthuman condition, whereas transhumanism has been 
full of science and technology um, since its, its onset, especially a deep dive into philosophy and computer science, looking at the earliest elements of encryption and blockchain and, and Bitcoin to artificial intelligence and nanotechnology, life extension, space exploration, and um, overcoming disease. The, um, the books that I would recommend, of course, are The Transhumanist Reader, which has 72 authors in it, all scholars, and first place our first hand, I should say, primary sources of knowledge that was developed by them, not others parroting them, for example. Um, so that's the first book I would recommend. I'd also recommend taking the course Transhumanism, an introduction that is presented at the Center for Transhumanist Studies that is online, very inexpensive, only $25, and is rich and full of ideas across the different views um, within the philosophy of transhumanism. I'd also recommend um, paying attention to people like Martin Rothblatt, who is a, a leader in the transgender arena, and she wrote the book The Apartheid of Sex in 1995, which is um, pretty um, amazing. Uh, the work of Anders Sandberg, uh, the work of Max Moore, of course, the, the a philosopher of transhumanism. And um, I think that there are so many individuals um, across fields, especially a transdisciplinary uh, scope of knowledge that transhumanism um, is aligned with. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, one of the things that's intrigued me, and I, I actually, I was just blown away by this. When I started doing story research for this interview, I, I started to realize how rapidly this community is growing. I, I, I was actually just blown away at how how many people are coming into transhumanism and embracing this philosophy and getting involved. And so I wanted to ask you about that because again, this, this community growth, I just, I really haven't seen anything like it. Now, do you think the rapid advances in medical technology might be part of that where it's inspiring millennials towards trans, transhumanism, getting younger people involved? And then, from from the other aspect of that, I was wondering if maybe the aging boomer population is also kind of coming into the fold as well as bringing funding with them as they look for ways to increase their longevity. I think you're you're absolutely spot on in in in, in both counts. Um, the um, and I'd like to add to that, it's not just the baby boomers realizing that we are aging and looking at anti-aging, which is really sequestered within transhumanism because at the core of transhumanism is extending human life. Um, um, but I, I think you're you're spot on with the, the, the baby boomer generation looking at aging and going, whoa, wait a minute, it's it's all of a sudden upon me or us and let's do something about it. I think it's also the the um, the other generations, the X generation, the Y generation, the the um, the uh, looking at the the generation that doesn't even want to identify as a generation. So games, I think, have added to transhumanism within the um, the scope of those who play a lot of games because there's a lot of uh, reference to characters and um, um, uh, Du Ex Machina, for example, um, was based on a transhumanist story. And um, when you look at a lot of the, the TV shows on Netflix, uh, like Expanse and Upload and um, uh, you know, Westworld and, you know, a lot of AI and a lot of the um, the prosthetic uh, augmentations of avatars and um, humanoids or robot humans. Uh, so that's really interesting. So I think science fiction um, has done a lot of damage to, to ideas about the future from a dystopian negative view, which is always about war and fighting, um, and, the, and, and the, the very mythic and lore about Prometheus or Pandora's box or uh, Icarus, <laughs> you know, those stories that we're not supposed to reach too high or too far, because if we do, something bad is going to happen. But I think we pretty much overcome that. Um, 
Another area that I think is really important is encryption. We have to protect our identity, our computers, our devices. So because we carry devices around with us everywhere and they've become an, an, what I call an exoperipheral central nervous system, they have to be protected. Um, so encryption and understanding identity and protection is really important. And that's always been at the core of uh, transhumanism in the early days in the 1990s. Uh, the other area is gender identification. Transhumanism has always been about um, cross gender, never identifying as one gender or another. And, and, and people can, you know, um, be who they want to be. And so transhumanism has been at the forefront of this, this whole uh, gender identification, not just with transgender, but with looking at interchangeable gender, and you don't have to be a binary system of genders. And um, I think that's very important. So now that people are looking at how they want to identify themselves, I think that ties into transhumanism. Uh, not that transhumanism is part of that community, the LGBTQ, but it, it has been supportive of it for, for eons. I mean, long before it became popular to be supportive of it. It's also been very supportive of women and long before the Me Too movement and women's rights and, and looking at women as, as consequential, if not essential, to um, the, uh, the, the future because of the, the talents and skills that women have not only innately, but have, have gone through the, the trenches to be recognized for, especially in the sciences and technologies and philosophies. Um, well, actually in, in all fields, but I, and I also think it's grown because of the internet. Um, long before the internet, we had the World Wide Web and a transhumanist organization that I was part of had the first email list on the World Wide Web. And that was pretty cool. And we talked about and debated life extension and genetic engineering and looking at different bodies, whole body prosthetics, um, encryption, blockchain, um, nanomedicine, nanotechnology, and most of it was based on AI. And so now that AI has become mainstream, a lot of the early ideas that, that were very transhumanist in scope has also become mainstream. Well, that's wonderful. That's, that's, and that's so in-depth. It sounds like you're describing really it's benefiting from a convergence then, really. It's just many different things that are kind of converging to drive that forward. That's that's really what it sounds like. Well said. Well said, Tim. Yeah. Well, so how would transhumanism differ from something like, I mean, because it, it includes body augmentation, it it includes life extension, you know, as you've mentioned, it includes gender fluidity. There are a lot of these concepts that are, are kind of under this umbrella of transhumanism, but it seems like it's something more and it's something larger. Uh, is, is there kind of a, a good way to define that umbrella term that all of these communities fit under, I guess? Yeah, I think it's evolution. And evolution is, you know, if, if we look around us in, in everything, um, everything is evolving and changing uh, life, not just human life, but the ecology, the ecosystem is constantly evolving and um, changing. And it's a system of feedback and control. And it has numerous variables within it that influence other variables. And so it's dynamic. And there can be entropy within it to be sure that, you know, the, the, um, the, um, decay and erosion of people or ideas or life as well as the 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 um the seeding and um provocation of life is occurring so we have to be very flexible and agile in not only in our minds but in our bodies and accept that these challenges and changes are happening so on a larger um view i think that that evolution and understanding it through the lens of transhumanism is that the uh, the the human species is a species to be sure, and it's part of the uh, the hominid, and it's part of the the Homo sapiens sapiens. But that is not the final stage. That if we evolve to get to this point, then we must have evolved something else to get here. So, in in that sense, uh, who is to say that the human is is the final? Um, um, conglomeration of, of decades and centuries and millennia of, of shifts in matter. And um, 
the evolution, well, it seems like it, 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 an, an okay term that's been used over and over, but it's, I think that understanding that we are evolving and changing and we don't know what that change will bring about. And anyone who says that they know what the future is, is, is either, you know, a, a, has some kind of superpower or is fabricating it for to sell a product. I think as futurists, we all need to be very careful about that and, and our predictions that we make. Um, but the bottom line is we don't know the changes that are ahead of us. And we must understand that we are evolving and to be flexible, adaptable in this, um, this system of change, as well as um, keep ourselves not only flexible, but I think the plasticity of the brain is a good analysis there. We talk about the plasticity in the brain is essential to keep our cognitive functions as, as fluid as possible, as functional as possible. We also have to do it in our, our uh, understanding of the world, in, in our perceptions of the world, in our judgments and, and biases and prejudices to uh, see that we ought not to say that this is where we're going to be, or this is who we are, um, that absolutes are a thing of the past. Mm. Yeah, and again, that's it's an amazing concept, conceptually. Yeah, that plasticity, I think, for me, that resonates very much. Now, so I, I wanted to touch on augmentation for a moment, because in the last few decades, I mean, artificial joints, implants, other technologies like that, are regularly implanted in humans to repair or augment the body. It's mm -hmm. so commonplace now in the medical establishment that we don't even think about it, right? Artificial joints are, are the best mm -hmm. example. It's, people get that operation done all the time. Nobody even questions it. It's just a matter of course. Mm -hmm. could, could you make the argument that transhumanism, at least in many ways, is already here and maybe the difference now is a matter of degree, I guess? Yeah, sure, sure. I think that um, if the meaning of transhuman, now transhuman separate from the philosophy, a transhuman is a human in transition that is transforming from the um, biological animal stage of our evolution into something else. And that, as we've seen, is done through augmentations or enhancements. So altering biology primarily and fundamentally. Uh, yeah, we've, we've uh, been transhuman. We could even say from the beginning when we built our first tool to help us survive um, and to communicate. Uh, yeah, some people say we've always been cyborg and there's this, this, been this issue of the, the difference between the term cyborg and the term transhuman. And I think it's gotten obfuscated a lot. A, a cyborg, according to the individuals who coined the term, made it up, wrote it down, and defined it, created the cyborg for space exploration, that the human body, because of its bone density and, and muscle, muscle mass, needed to have a, an, an, an augmentation to be able to survive in zero G and, the, and survive the radiation of the sun, et cetera which would you know, severely damage the body. So Manfred Klein and Nathan Klein looked at us, created cyborg for um, what we, how we'd need to augment ourselves. But they were thinking more in, in terms of space suits um, rather than um, gene editing or stem cell cloning or you know, um, augmentation as far as you know, uploading or downloading or you know, adding to the body in, in other ways. Um, so, I just wanted to make that distinction. Uh, there's nothing wrong with cyborg. It's used in academics very much and in science fiction, but in the real world, I think the term transhuman better fits this evolution we're going through because um, the human as a species is an animal and it is defined as such and has a limited lifespan based on its biological and inherited um, condition. The transhuman is in that transition state to what we will become and we do not know what that is. It could be an extension of the human. We may at one time need to redefine human as we may, may need to redefine the term death. Um, but for now, we, we say transhuman. I don't think we've always been transhuman. I think that we've always been innovative, inventive, exploratory, and um, survivalist. 
that to survive was the, the, the general instinct and drive of early hominids going through the Athelopithecus to you know the various stages to where we are today. Uh, it's been to survive. And, and through that language was developed and their different tools were developed. And it's really beautiful from an anthropological point of view to take a look at that history. Um, I think that we're more transhuman today um, in light of um, the different devices that have augmented us, meaning, you know, computers certainly augmenting our brain with backing up our memory, not literally backing up, but affording our, our memory uh, um, a place to be, um, securing um, our information, our smart devices, our phones are pretty cool. Um, and um, the advances in neuropharmacology is amazing and the advances in augmenting the human body with um, roboticized AI driven haptic system um, devices such as prosthetic legs and prosthetic arms is, is quite marvelous when you take a look at how that's grown by leaps and bounds over the past 20 years. Um, a prosthetic um, body part used to be something one was uh, ashamed of, maybe hid. And today, um, most people with these body parts show them off. And, you know, I always compliment them. Every time I see a prosthetic leg, I'm going to go, you know, cool if, if there is a level of, you know, eye contact there. I certainly wouldn't interrupt someone mm -hmm. and point that out. That'd be a little bit um, rude, perhaps. But um, I think that we're more transhuman today because people are saying, I don't want to age so quickly. Life is too short. And we're hearing people say, I, I don't want to get dementia. I want to preserve my memories. And um, no one wants their children or their parents or their loved ones or even their, anyone to suffer from a, a horrific disease. We want to put an end to that. Well, you know, and, and if I could transition a bit to the the uh, the life extension aspect of this. And I know that is such an important part, not only of your own work and your own passion, but also in this community. So a, a couple of the ones that I've been following, I'm I'm an enormous fan of Dr. David Sinclair's work. I'm not sure if you followed him, but he, he's been doing a lot with NMN that's he's he's working on extending what he calls the health span of test animals and he also his team just recently announced that by applying selectively three of the four yamanaka factors they they claim they've been able to reverse aging in cells are you familiar with his work at all mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now so so that that was that was one of them um now the, the other one since I'm, I'm mentioning these the other one was um of, of course liz parish right who use genetically engineered retroviruses to lengthen her telomeres and give herself a myostatin inhibitor for increased you know, muscle. It's, it's interesting. Um, uh, I read that in your questions. Um, myostatin inhibitors have been used for years and years mm. and years by athletes, especially bodybuilders. Um, I, I'd rather not get into that particular body of work and talk about gene editing. Um, uh, and, and the field of, of lengthening telomeres has been around for a long time. And it's, it's one of the theoretical approaches to what causes aging and how to slow down aging, as well as, you know, just, you know, yeah, it's ingrained in the genes or edit, um, uh, pro programmed in the genes, programmed in gene. But if you want to take a look at what causes aging or what causes certain diseases, I mean, the list of theories has been, you know, it's, it's almost a mile long. Um, as far as taking a look at um, inhibiting um, different types of things that can cause uh, one to age, and I think that as a bodybuilder, I'm I'm only aware of this because I've been involved in weightlifting, um, body sculpting uh, for you know, decades, and I've taken creatine and other different uh, mu muscle building or um, uh, myostatin inhibitors for a long time. You don't need to go to the length of gene editing for that; they're available readily. Um, for that, but uh, we need to be really careful about gene editing and, and what we're doing because we don't know some of the results. For example, with the, the uh, telomere or the enzyme telomerase, sometimes lengthening the telomere can cause cancer. So you want to be really careful there. And I have um, firsthand experience in being very careful about uh, human growth hormone. I spoke to my medical advisor, who's one of the, the leading specialists in um, um, some of the um, advances in 
um, different um, supplements one can take. And um, he said, I am not a candidate for that because I have had cancer. I've had bladder cancer and skin cancer. So mm. you don't want, if you've had cancer, if you have cancer in your, your uh, history, uh, you know, your genetic history, you want to be very careful about some of these things. Um, so I, I think as life extensionists, people get really excited about, you know, we're all zero patients um, with a lot of things. I made a film in 2005, I think it was, on I rebuilt my bone system and muscular system through uh, a certain um, uh, protocols, scientific protocols. Um, I was suffering from early onset osteopenia and uh, muscle loss, and I countered that, and it's in my PhD dissertation, my uh, doctoral dissertation on the work I did on that, and I had a team of advisors, of course, but I reversed the oste osteopenia and the, the bone density, and I also built up muscles around that area um, through different other types of things. Um, and uh, so you, it, we don't need to go so far with gene editing, but the beauty of the history of, of genetic uh, engineering and gene editing, it goes back to the 1980s. And uh, so the first gene editing uh, was identified there. And it's really marvelous to, to track the history of some of the protocols that we talk about today and see when they were first done. And people forget about that there is this the, a, incredible history. Um, for example, here's an analogy. The first test tube baby was in 1978. And um, everyone was astounded, you know, about that. But if we look 20 years before that, there was experiments in labs with test tube babies. And um, so that they didn't go to the birthing stage as with, you know, Miss Brown. So that was, it didn't get the promotion um, that was set up for it. So um, I think that, that taking a look at genetic engineering, uh, gener uh, retroviruses, it's a type of virus that has a special enzyme called reverse trans, I'm looking at transcriptase to translate genetic information to DNA. That's been used as an agent to carry other information. And it's like, you know, if we want nano robots to go in our body, they'll go in our body like little viruses, or we can travel on the backs of viruses to um, take good things into the body and, and reverse um, some of our DNA. Um, the a term there is a GDF8 or the growth differentiation factor eight is really important. Um, Catherine uh, de Malis published a paper, um, and uh, I think it was I'm not sure what the date was, but it's called genetically increased telomere length and anti and aging related traits, a really good published paper. Another interesting thing about increasing telomeres is led by John Ramonas um, and team who published their findings in the FASEB journal in 2015. So those are two good things to read. And lastly, I just want to mention the National Library of Medicine published an article in 2020 on the telomere length and, and risks, um, whether it's short or long, what are the risks of short telomere length versus the risk of long telomere length? So these are really good uh, other things to look at. Um, you uh, mentioned, um, uh, let's see, um, uh, oh, David Sinclair, yes. Um, he's really publishing a lot these days, uh, you know, books and getting out there. I don't think he's a first place holder. I think he's someone who has read a lot of other people's work, which he should do and we all should do before we, we put out our own work because we may say that the, we're the first or the original and we're, you know, if we're not, you know, we're gonna get spanked for that. <laughs> you know, it's be very careful. Um, I, I don't even know where many things originate. Um, I'm often called a pioneer of this and that and the other thing. And 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 as far as getting it out there in the mainstream, that is true. But I, I think that probably it's not true if you look at the history of what other people have done and how it's led up to my own work, especially like Prima Post Human, which is the first whole body prosthetic concept uh, from a theoretical approach in prototyping it to um, even my work with long-term memory is considered a scientific breakthrough, it's a first, but I'm sure someone else worked on that uh, protocol uh, prior to me, but didn't have my methodology. And so you publish your methodology and then, um, but I, I try to look back and include, and in fact, when I went back, I had to, um, 
uh, re-edit my published paper and include another footnote or endnote, I should say, or reference citation um, to someone's work that um, was really consequential. So David Sinclair, I think he's got some good ideas. I'm not quite sure about what he's promoting um, with, um, I'm very, uh, um, uh, speculation. So why um, do you think that this um, particular um, protocol or methodology that he's promoting is um, something that you really want to support and get into? Well, yeah, again, those those are two that have just been particularly interesting for me. With David Sinclair's work, he's, a, a, as you've mentioned, he has done a lot of derivative work on, on other people's research, and it seems like he's trying to synthesize things based on that. So that, for me, that's that's been very exciting. Yeah, I think that NMN, you know, these, these are, you know, people get confused with these terms. There's, there's lots of different um, terms that people are using. It's... Um, we're talking about absorption. And one of the things that we've learned through um, uh, unraveling our, our DNA is that we thought it was all about uh, genomics and the gene that we find, oh, there's this thing called proteinomics and there's a protein. And then we have to look deeper into that. So the more we learn, the more that is coming up. Um, one thing that's really interesting in all the research that's being done, it's how we absorb the mm. the 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 elixir let's just call it um not all bodies can absorb um medications or products or uh, supplements at the same rate um so we have to be very careful there there um sometimes you may have and again this is getting into the very details of genetic um uh, uh architecture that if you have a particular enzyme or a mutation within an aspect of a gene that doesn't accept maybe something that everyone else is taking that's really going to um, make them more youthful, for example, it's going to damage you. Ah, so okay. that there are, you have to really know. And the best way to find that out is to have your gene sequence. Um, even at a basic level with 23andMe, you, it'll tell you what you are missing to help you better digest or the, have the supplement work. And a, a very basic mainstream way of, of saying this is some people can't take in lactose or lactate. Um, they're lactate lactose deficient. They don't have the enzymes to digest milk or cheese or, or cow products. So they have to work around it. Well, a lot of people didn't understand that. I remember I was in the hospital um, at, I think, 17, 18 years old for a disease. And they kept on giving me more and more lactose. And I was, uh, I couldn't digest it. And I was getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And finally, I, you know, they allowed me to leave. And it wasn't until years later, I found out that, that I have to be very careful. The same with um, things like uh, gluten. Now you have to look on the packages, gluten-free. Some people just can't absorb certain nutrients as well as supplements or elixirs um, that other people can. So um, stem cells, gene editing, all that has to be done on a personalized basis. And we're not quite there yet. Ah. Um, yeah. So I noticed that he also supports NAD. And NAD has is, is become um, uh, um, a fad um, uh, supplement. Um, but we're not sure how well it really works. And um, there's so many, and you can go to all these life extension conferences and they'll have trade shows that, that push different supplements and, and, and make claims. Well, maybe those claims are true. Maybe they are ethical for certain people, but not all people are the same. And I think those who um, identify this early on in their work and in their, their sponsorship and promotion of their own products, uh, put that warning out there, get your gene sequence, find out if you have anything that's not going to digest or take in this supplement or um, um, protocol because it's really important. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, so, you know, next I'd like to ask about Alcor. And this is something that you've had a long-term association with. Uh -huh. They specialize in cryogenically freezing humans in the hopes of reviving them with future advances in technology. So I, I was just wondering if you could update me on how Alcor is doing. I mean, they, they've been around for a very long time. They are, in my opinion, they are kind of the most reputable. They've done all sorts of breakthrough work there. Uh, do you have any kind of updates on, on where things are going in terms of cryogenics advances in that field? And is that something, would you consider that maybe a, a viable alternative? I mean, for, for people where maybe they're beyond the benefits of today's life extension, mm -hmm. is, is cryopreservation, cryotransport something they should be looking at, do you think? Oh, absolutely. I really do. And in all sincerity, um, everything I have researched, studied, um, I think cryonics ought to be plan A. Just like I'm very um, uh, careful about certain things in my life. Um, I come from a background where I was a fine artist and, and performer for many, many years. Um, and I didn't think about money because I, I never had to worry really about money. Uh, it wasn't something that, that you know, I, I always knew to work and, and make a living. I, I was very careful about saving and whatnot. But um, a lot of people don't pay attention to their insurance, auto insurance or health insurance or, um, you know, their savings. You know, they live from paycheck to paycheck. And that's not a very smart thing to do because you can lose your job at any time or run into a difficult time. So I'm someone who's very pragmatic. And I think that chronics is the smartest thing to do as far as if you're into longevity or life extension on any level, get a chronics insurance plan. Because if you do, you will feel, you'll sleep more soundly and be more confident because that, you know, the, um, Death is around us at every corner. Anything can happen at any time. And most of us experience it ourselves or with people we know or, or witnessed it in some ways or read about it at least. Know that uh, life is not a, a promise. It's, it's, it's something that, you know, it's, it's, it's a very um, uh, unstable. Yeah. And the best way to... You can be the smartest person in the world and and done the, the incredible scientific research and really been seminal in your research, but you could also, oops, fall down. Someone hits you. Yeah, these accidents happen. Maybe you'll take a medication that doesn't agree with another medication and you forgot that you were on this other medication and, and you die in your sleep. These things happen all the time. They happen on a daily basis or, you know, and, and of course, we don't think about it because we don't want to be, you know, crazy and and uh, uh, OCD about about death. But we need to just apply some common sense and some practicality. So, chronics I see is Plan A. What is this? The state of the science and technology of chronics? It keeps on advancing all the time. The crowd perfusants are at the best stage that they've ever been, thanks to Dr. Greg Fay. Um, the ability to see the um, the uh, viability of the brain after crowd preservation is something that we can now do with the CT scanner, looking through the aluminum doer at the brain that has been vitrified. And the evidence shows that there is little to no fracturing of, of a crystallization of cells uh, from the, in the frozen state that have uh, fractured, causing uh, severe problems for the brain. Um, and, and that's really a good thing to be able to see into uh, how the patient is. Um, vitrification still stands out as being a, a primary uh, methodology. It's used, uh, vitrification is used with uh, embryos, um, sperm, egg, organs, et cetera. So it is the, the best that we have today. Um, so no matter, um, how, again, how smart you are or, or how healthy you are, how athletic you are, it's best to get your plan in, in, in the process, if not completed and put away, and then you're done, just like your state planning, you know, that's getting your living will and estate planning can seem daunting to many people and they don't have it. But anyone in the United States who doesn't have this in place will 
if they were to die, their uh, estate would go into probate. No matter if you just own a car, if you own a mansion, it doesn't matter. Uh, it still goes through the courts. It's, it's very lengthy and very um, expensive and your children will not get what you have willed to them if it goes into probate more likely yeah. than not. So you want to be very careful about that. Now, um, Alcor, Alcor, uh, in my view, and, and from looking at the stats of the different organizations going on, still is the uh, world leading organization. Uh, Switzerland's doing quite well with their organization. Um, um, Alcor itself, um, as long as Max is at the, at the helm as its ambassador and president emeritus, I think it'll do well. Um, if they, um, there is no, um, the former president CEO, Patrick, um, is no longer with Alcor and, um, uh, the, um, the location is still in Scottsdale and it still looks good and everything's going well. I think that, uh, it's still getting tremendous documentaries and press. So the concept of, of cryonics and the, the, um, the uh, research being done in it is still good. Um, I wanted to do a secondary project since um, I did, I worked on long-term memory of a simple animal and, and I was successful with my scientific research and published and awarded and all of that, which is really great. I would like to do another project. Um, there was a, a project I was going to do with neurons, um, but that's kind of on hold at the moment. Um, but I think there can be more and more projects. Chronics will probably not be recognized by the mainstream until a mammal or a larger animal is revived. And I know that, and um, I'm a big key spokesperson for that. Um, and I think that as long as Max Morse is recognized as um, the, uh, the go-to person for the not only the practice of, of human cryopreservation, the science, the technology, uh, the advances, the pragmatic aspects of it, the legal aspects of it and all that will be doing well um, because of his level of ethics and integrity. So as long as Max is, is at the forefront of cryonics, I think that we'll all be safe. But we also have to be very cautious about new cryonics organizations coming about that may not have the, 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 the protocol that best is in the patient's best interest. They might, yeah. you know, it's just like any business might come along and try to do things faster, or get their name out there faster, or, you know, um, maybe save money, do, you know, some things that uh, may not work in the long run. So we really, when you sign up for Chronics, make sure that you sign up with an, an organization that is has an incredible level of integrity. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, because cryo storage could take potentially so long. So Natasha, thank you again. Thank you so much for joining me today. Let me close by asking what, what comes next for you? What are the projects that you're currently working on and where do you see yourself in the near future? Oh, let's see. You know, it, it's interesting. I, I love the work I did in the uh, late 1990s when designing the um, the whole body prosthetic engineered through narrow AI and haptic systems and nanorobotics. I think that project um, still holds water. And I just did a revision on that, updating it with nanomedicine. And I think nanomedicine uh, may be the uh, the scientific breakthrough that we're all be all waiting for um, to extend life. And that's really exciting for me. Uh, I uh, continue teaching transhumanism and uh, working towards helping people um, advance their level of understanding and ability to um, critique, debate, question, um, and um, uh, um, just, you know, we talk about extending lives, we need to extend our brains, you know, we need to become smarter and, and more fluid in our thinking. Um, I have a book that will be coming out probably in 2024. Uh, it's beautiful science, and um, so that's exciting for me. But other than that, I just continue to um, give talks and do documentaries, and I think about the future um, and how I can better serve um, others with my many 
years in, in academics and and in the world of science you know it's and and in the world of the arts too i mean there's there's this wonderful confluence of science and the arts and education that that i absolutely adore and um I hope to be around long enough for that. I'm healthy and well. I continue to be athletic, and um, I love that. I love my two dogs and um, all my friends. I, I feel so uh, happy to have as many friends and supporters that I do, as well as supporting so many people that I absolutely adore. There's some great people in the world, and we all need to support each other in these ways. And um, be better bullshit detectors too. You know, when someone is trying to pull one over us, you know, no, don't do that. Catch it, correct it, and wish people well. Always wish people well. And um, and, and, and Tim, as far as you're concerned, I, I love what you're doing. I think that you are uh, providing a source of knowledge where it's needed. And I think I really respect, and I think that the, the service that you're providing is essential because you don't, you're not selling a product. You're not, you're, what you're doing is you're informing through knowledge. And I think that is so desperately needed to get beyond these polarized views and um, binary thinking. We need more of, of this. So thank you. Ah, uh, well, thank you again. Thank you again. And have a wonderful day. Thank you.